Hi, I'm Seb Ben Yaakov. The title of this presentation is Basics of PWM Converters Controller Design. This is the first part of a two-part lecture, it's a long lecture, so I've split it into two parts. The second part includes some uh, actual examples. Now, uh, the problem that we have here is that we have a power stage and there is an output voltage that we want to control. We would like to stabilize it. To do that, we compare it to a reference by this uh, junction here, feed the difference to a controller. We generate a duty cycle so as to correct the output whenever it deviates uh, from the value that we need. This part is a switching system. This part could be an analog controller or could be a digital controller. Now here we see it in a little bit more detail. This is the power stage. We have the output section. We are sampling the output, feeding it to a controller and generating the duty cycle uh, as required to stabilize the output. Here below we have a, an example of a analog controller, which would include typically a error amplifier. One side we feed the reference, the other side is the output or part of the output. If the output is higher than the reference, we generate an error signal, feeding it to the modulator, which produces a duty cycle. And then we have a driver to drive the gate, uh, say of a MOSFET uh, transistor. However, this error amplifier needs some network around it for phase compensation, which is the subject matter uh, of this uh, presentation. So we have to design here some network in order to stabilize the system and get the response uh, that we wish. So here's another look at the system. And we, di we distinguish between large sigma signal and small signal. Dynamic analysis are normally done on the small signal. Small signal, signal is the deviation of the value from the large signal, okay? So we actually look now at the small signal transfer ratios of this system. We have a small signal here, generate a small signal error, and generate a small signal duty cycle. Now, what does this uh, small signal duty cycle mean? Let's have a look at it more closely. Suppose this is the error amplifier, this is the large signal, but it has a small signal on it. Consequently, we are going to have a duty cycle, which is changing like this, well, sort of. And then if we look at it on the oscilloscope, uh, we'll synchronize it to the edge here. We'll see the duty cycle sort of moving back and forth. This is what we mean by the small signal uh, of the duty cycle, okay? So here we have the power stage. Here we have the error amplifier. Here I'm showing already some of the network you need around it in order to stabilize and get the performance that you want. This is then goes into the modulator. Now this part here is known. Uh, we know the features of the power stage. Obviously we do have to have information about the power stage we are going to uh, control. And the modulator has also some sort of a uh, transfer function. This is uh, the problem of the controller design. Uh, this is the analog case uh, which we are concentrating on in this presentation. Let me talk a little bit about uh, feedback system. A typical feedback system will look like this. This is the open loop block. We have a feedback path. This is the beta, this is the feedback. We have the feedback signal coming in, a summing junction. This is the reference. This is what we want to be the output or some function of the input. And uh, the closed loop response of this system, that is the response between uh, input and output, that is the ratio between S out over S in, uh, will be uh, A open loop. This is this transfer function over one plus beta A open loop. An important point is that when A open loop is large and much larger than one, we can neglect one. Uh, this sort of cancels out and we get that the 
loop gain is 1 over beta. This is the most important part or feature of uh, negative feedback that you get a gain which is independent of a open loop. However, if beta is very small uh, as compared to 1, then of course you go back to a open loop. The loop gain again is the total gain over this loop here. In our case, we have a power stage, we have a voltage divider, here is the junction, this is the summing junction here, comparing part of the V out to the V reference, generating some error signal and going back. This is in fact beta, this part here. This is in fact the whole path here is a open loop, you might say. Uh, so it's a little bit different from the classical uh, picture of a loop, a uh, closed loop system, but of course it fits the same template, although it's sort of drawn uh, differently. So here it is. We have the power system, we have the voltage divider. This is the summing junction. This is the reference here. We are comparing the reference to part of the output. This is actually the controller. This part here, which I'll call A now, is known. We know, or we should know, or we have to know, all the features of this power stage, and definitely we know the voltage divider. Now, this part here is the part that we have to design. Uh, we have here the modulator, which is known, but then there is the air amplifier here uh, that we have to uh, shape in order to get the response we want. Now, let's talk a little bit about stability. A closed loop system can be expressed as a transfer function, and here it is in the Laplace um, representation, Laplace transform representation, and this transfer function will have a polynomial at the numerator and a polynomial at the uh, denominator. These polynomials have roots. These are zeros here, and these are poles here. Now, the only reason that the system will be unstable is when the poles, or some of the poles, are on the right half side of the complex plane of this S uh, variable. That is, if we have poles here on this right half side, then the system will be unstable because we'll have a turn which is kind of uh, diverging. Only if we have poles on the negative half side, if all the poles are restricted to this region, then uh, the system is stable. So one of the major objective of a controller design is to make sure that all the poles are here. Although it's usually uh, defined in different terms, but this is the final objective because this is the real reason why a system will be stable. Now, how can we tell if a system like this has a, this is in the frequency domain, but uh, uh, we usually do the analysis uh, in the frequency domain. The question is, how can we tell if this system will have poles in the right half side of the complex flag? To do this, we can use the Nyquist criterion that I'll talk about in a minute. And this will tell us if there are poles in the right half side of the complex plane. Now, the Nyquist criteria is not very user friendly. Although with computer graphics today, you can do it, but uh, it's much easier to work in the border plane. So we actually translate the Nyquist criterion to the border plane, and I'll talk about it in, in a few minutes. So what is the Nyquist criterion? We use a graph here, a plane here, in which the y-axis is the imaginary part of the loop gain, and this is the real part of the loop gain. Okay? Now this vector here is the loop gain at any one frequency. That is, uh, frequency starts from here, this is zero frequency, and then the frequency goes up and up and up, and each point here, the given frequency, this will be the loop gain, and this is the phase of the loop gain. Okay, this is the magnitude, and this is the phase. So we go around this circle, the Nyquist circle here, from zero to infinity. Now, 
we are talking about this criterion, which talks about negative and positive frequencies. This is the positive frequency, and we have a mirror image of the negative frequency. So this completes the circle. So this is a complete circle here, and this is the direction of this circle. Okay, this is the clockwise direction. We have here also a point which is minus one on the real axis, and I've also drawn the unit circle. This is the locus of all the points which have a magnitude of one, okay? So this is one, and here it's one, etc. This is one. Now the Nygren criteria says that if you go clockwise and you encircle the minus one point, then you do have poles on the right side of the complex plane. So, in order to make sure that the system is stable, you have to make sure that you don't encircle this point. So this is a stable system. You don't circle it, and that's fine. You know that in this system, you'll have no poles at the right half side of the complex plane. This, however, is a borderline case in which you encircle or you just touch the minus one point, and this is in the case of an oscillator, which is something that you don't want, and this is really a bad case in which you encircle the minus one point, and so this system will be unstable. Okay, so we see that here we go and we circle it, and this is the negative frequencies completing the circle, and this is an unstable system. Now, we can see here something very important that we'll talk about it, about it a little bit later, and that is that phase lag, or phase delay, plays an important role in stability. Because phase, this is the phase. And if there is a phase lag in the system, then this pushes the circle to go sort of around the minus one. If, however, there is a lag and which is sort of pushes back this point, the, the angle becomes smaller, then you'll be on the safe side. So that phase lag, phase delays in a feedback system are very bad because they are pushing the circle to encircle the minus one point. So this is a very important point to remember. So as I've said, although the Nyquist criteria is of course very strong, uh, it is rather user unfriendly. It's not user friendly. And uh, it's not very convenient to draw all these circles. So what is usually done, we translate it into the border plane. How, how do we do it? So this is now each point on this circle here, on this plot here, each point is this is the magnitude. So now we split this into two parts, the magnitude and the phase. So this is, for each frequency, this is now the frequency here. We see now the frequency. Here we don't see the frequency. Each point here is another frequency. Here we see the frequency. For any frequency, we see the magnitude. A given frequency, this is the magnitude. And on this plot, for each frequency, we see the phase. This is, say, this frequency here. This will be the magnitude. This will be here the phase, okay? So we sort of split this into two parts. Now, this unit circle here that goes through the minus one point means that this is the locus or the place at which the mag any point on it has the magnitude of one. One is zero dB. So this circle here is this zero dB line, okay? Furthermore, as this border plot goes here and enters or crosses the unit circle, that is, crosses the point of magnitude 1, this corresponds exactly to this point. This is when this magnitude crosses the 0 dB. So here we have this 0 dB here, we have the 0 dB here. And the phase here is the phase, this is the phase. So this is the phase, 
And the difference between the phase in 180 degree, this is 100 up to here, between here and here, 180 degree, this difference is defined as the phase margin, how close you are to this line. And here it is, this is the actual phase, and this is the phase margin, okay? This is the phase margin, the difference between 180 degree and the phase. You like to have this phase margin to be large or to be positive. Well, depending on how you define it. Anyhow, you don't want the phase to reach 180 degree. In fact, you want it to be lower. That is, you have to. You like to have a phase margin uh, which is not zero or certainly not negative. That is. Uh, that is, you cross it here. Why is that? Because if you want to make sure that you are not encircling the minus one point, you have to enter the unit circuit somewhere here, 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 or here. In all these cases, the phase angle is less than 180 degrees. When you encircle the minus one point, say if this curve goes like this, okay, then you have an angle which is larger than 180 degrees and the phase margin will be negative. So therefore, the phase margin is very important. You don't want it to be close to zero. You don't want this angle to be close to zero. You like to make sure that you're entering this unit circle as low as lower end angle as you can. Now, the effect of a phase margin is very uh, pronounced. If the phase margin is small, this is a function of time. This is a case of a phase margin, which is a small phase margin. What you have is overshoots. And then in the uh, frequency domain, uh, you will have sort of a, a hump here uh, because of the high Q. It can be shown that a small phase margin is like having a high Q of the system. And here is a plot, sort of a uh, approximate plot, of the overshoots that you'll have as a function of the phase margin. The smaller the phase margin, the larger the overshoots that you'll have. And this is this um, added gain here, uh, the Q or the peak that you'll have is also a function of the phase margin. The smaller the phase margin, the larger this peak will be. So therefore, in a proper design, you like to keep the phase margin to be larger than about 40 degrees. This is a design objective. You have to make sure that in your design, phase margin is larger than 40 degrees in order not to have too many, uh, too high overshoot or too very high uh, gain uh, increase at the resonant frequency. Okay, so how can we make sure that indeed we comply with this first margin uh, requirement. Let's first of all look at the, some of the features of this uh, plot, of the border plot of a real system. Now I'm talking about a minimum phase system. This is a system without right half plane zero. Okay, I'm not talking about poles, I'm not talking about zeros. Now, a system which is which has a right half plane zero is a non-minimum phase system. This system has some different characteristics, and in fact, we do have uh, switch mode converters like a boost converter might have a, a right half plane zero. So I'm not talking about these uh, systems, and or at least let's say that I'm talking about the portion of the transfer function which does not have a right half plane zero because it's a different story complicates things and in fact you like to run away from this region so in this region all the zeros are on the negative half plane now a very important feature of the body plot is that there is a tight connection between phase and gain so if you have a pole here, then you have a breakpoint in the gain 
and it started to go, roll down at minus 20 dB per decade. At the same time, the, the phase starts to, you have a lag here, a phase lag, and it'll eventually uh, reach minus 90 degree. And then if you have another pole, there'll be another break, and you'll have a uh, slope of minus 40 dB per decade, and again, you'll have an added phase, okay? So, if you have a system with many, many uh, poles and zeros, it goes up and down, many slopes here, and you'll end up at the, around the crossover of the zero dB line, this is the zero dB line, the crossover, uh, you wind up with a certain slope, okay? Now, it is very important to understand and to realize that all this history is unimportant. That is, if you are inter interested in the phase of the system, that only the slope here is of importance. The reason why all these poles and zeros that you had before do not affect the phase in here is because once you have reached, and I'm showing here minus dB per decade slope, this means that all the poles, all the poles and the zero sort of cancelled out in terms of the phase shifts, and you were left alone with one, they call it dominant pole in this region. So all the slopes cancelled out and all the phases, the league the lag and lead phases cancelled out and you are left with one pole. So this is a very important and extremely useful feature that you don't have to worry about what is the history here once you reach this point and you see a slope of an extended range of minus 20 dB per decade, you know that the phase here is minus 90 degree. That's it. You don't care about what happened here. So, how do we approach the design? Let me talk a little bit about some of the technique. We have a open loop game of the system of part A. We have an open loop system of part B. And then this is the loop game. And we are supposed to work on this area. Now, this is known, this is unknown, this is what we have to design. We have to design it in such a way that the crossover will be such that the phase margin will be acceptable. If I draw this whole loop game this way, then if I change something, I have to redraw it and redraw it. In order to avoid this, what I suggest is a different way of doing the plotting. We start with a plot of the system itself, part A, and then we add part B as 1 over B, okay? This is 1 over B. That is, if plot B is in uh, dB, then 1 over b is just the negative mirror of it. And, as we know, if we look at this difference here, if we look at this difference here, this will be 20 log a, 20 log a, minus 20 log 1 over b, this is 1 over b, this is equal to 20 log b a. This means that this distance now, that this distance now, is actually the loop gain. And this point here, when 20 log A is equal to 20 log 1 over B, is in fact the 0 dB crossover point. Okay, so this is the 0 dB crossover point. Now the advantage of this approach is that you keep this part constant, this will be your controller, and you can then play with different shapes of the controller and look at this point, which is the crossover between um, the beta A and the zero dB line. So what we do then, we plot A, and then we design a 
one of the beta or one of the b I should say uh, in our notation such that the crossover of zero to b will be such that the rate of closure here rate of closure that is how fast or what the nature of this closure here is like 20 dB per decade. If this will be 20 dB per decade, we know that the phase will be 90 degree, and if the phase is 90 degree, then the phase margin is around 90 degree. Now, of course, if you are crossing it at a uh, pole point, there is an extra 45 degrees, so that uh, in this particular example, uh, the phase margin will be around 45 degrees, which is fine. If you, I would have crossed it here, it would have been 19 degrees. Now, if I cross it here, and this is 40 dB per decade, then the phase uh, margin will be very bad, be zero, and this will be an unstable system. So here are the various possibility of crossover. This is just of an imaginary uh, system, and this all are one over b, all these possible one over b. And I can tell very quickly that if the cross uh, over here will be like this, uh, the phase margin will be 90 degrees, here it will be 45, here it will be 90, 45. Here, if this is minus 40, and I'm able to cross uh, this uh, with 1 over b in with this minus 20 db line, this rate of closure corresponds to 20 db because this is 40, this is 9, uh, 20, and therefore uh, the phase margin will be 90 degree. And here again, because it's at a course over point, it'll be 45. So our objective in the designing of the controller is uh, to cross the A line with one over B in such a way that the phase margin will be okay. And there, are, as I've shown uh, in the previous slide, there are various ways to do it. Here's one way. This could be a controller here. This happens to be a PID controller, which uh, you see that you cross here uh, with a 1 over b with minus 20, this is 40 dB, and this is very fine, very fine. Now, there is one objective, is the phase margin. Another objective is the bandwidth. You like this crossover to be at a fairly high frequency, because the higher the frequency, the quicker is the response, the faster is the settling time. So, in fact, you have two objectives here. One, that the system will be stable. Second, that the bandwidth will be high. Obviously, you can't go to infinity, and there are many reasons for that. One of them is that you can't go to more than half the switching frequency, because then you enter some other problems that I'm not going to elaborate here. But uh, obviously, you'd like to have the crossover frequency high, as high as you can. So a controller design will include the selection of the crossover point. If the system here rolls at minus 40 dB per decade, you need a controller such that 1 over B will be a minus 20 dB per decade. Okay? So you select the frequency, you select the controller, and then of course you synthesize the controller that will meet these requirements. So this is the end of part one. As I've said, there is a part two uh, which I'm showing uh, some example of actual, actual uh, phase compensation. Thank you for your attention. I hope you found it interesting and it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you.